Hello, hello and welcome to uh, this uh, session. Um, as the uh, introduction uh, outlined, we'll be talking about uh, how essentially the, the market and private equity firms are potentially bracing for a market correction after such a record year for uh, the sector. Um, essentially, just to give, I guess, a bit of uh, context and to position the discussion um, and give a bit of an idea. I mean, by the first half of this year, we had private equity deal making soaring to its highest level since the lead up to the global financial crisis. Um, there is plenty, uh, as mentioned, of dry powder that has been raised and has not yet been spent. Um, uh, data provider Prequin actually estimated that as of June there was almost two and a half trillion dollars of dry powder at the ready and tens of billions of dollars more are being raised uh, of, for new funds. Now essentially the, the questions that we're trying to answer is, is this uh, buyout enthusiasm set on fizzling out or will this deal uh, uh, streak, I guess, continue, and what, essentially also what part does Asia play in all this, uh, considering the record uh, fundraising that we've seen here. Um, so uh, I guess if I could uh, start off uh, essentially by uh, asking uh, to uh, you, Yasir, I mean, you do share the view that uh, sort of highly competitive deal making uh, in the private equity space has also been causing inflated price points, uh, distortion also of uh, assets' true value. I mean, is this something that you are still witnessing and is something that it will co potentially continue in 2020? Yeah, I think we, we're going to continue to see inflation of assets, the valuation and all that. Because I think what we have seen so far, I think historically, if you look at 2018, it's been a record year for a lot of private equity funds from fundraising perspective, especially for the larger global funds. And then take that to one step further. So that we come to a, a situation where fund is towards the end life of the funds. They need to deploy their capital as soon as possible because they're raising new funds. And then the other bit is fund is just fresh coming out of fundraising exercise. So what we've seen is a nexus of both funds raising new funds as as well as fund that just raise a fund coming together, trying to find assets which is getting in South Asia are getting really really scarce, especially for good high growth uh, high growth assets. And what we've seen started seeing is that uh, in in a process where it is done or it's run pretty well. Uh, the valuation is being driven up to the roof. I mean, we've started seeing therefore even some smaller assets in Malaysia because as assets become scarce, uh, what we've seen is even the large private equity firm started looking at mid-market mid -market deals and driving the valuation upwards. And I think this trend is not, it's not going to stop at sometime in the future because I was just talking to Mir earlier as well that um, Asia now accounts for about 25 to 30 percent of overall private equity assets compared to about 10, 11 percent uh, uh, about a decade ago. So if you think about it, it's, it has been increasing on an exponential basis. Uh, granted, it's a lot of it been driven by China and India, China especially, but from the starting position of a decade ago versus where we are today, uh, we started seeing a huge amount of capital being drawn into Asia, and I think one of the misleading factors people always focus on, oh, this is Asia only fund, right? But the reality, if you track the numbers, is that it's not only the Asia only fund that's crowding out a lot of deals in Asia, but you start to see a lot of global funds coming into Asia as well and driving the valuation upwards. Exactly. I mean, in terms of this general, I guess, status quo uh, at the moment, where we do see so much unspent money, uh, so much money to be put to work, how does the Asia context, if in any way, differ, say, from markets like the US or Europe, especially in light of what you're saying as well? You, we have the big names coming in, changing also the market landscape. How is Asia positioned in this market context? Can I, uh, we, we said earlier that we we're going to try and disagree with each other, so I'm going to start. Please uh, do so. So, so say that I have to disagree with you. Look, I, I, I do agree that there's been a huge amount of capital that's raised, but I don't think that's the problem. I really don't think that we have enough dry powder, in fact, in Asia. And let, let's, let's think about it from a very global perspective. Look, we, we certainly believe this will be Asia's century. What does that actually mean? What it means is that over the next 10 years, 
four of the five largest economies of the world will be Asian. Seven out of ten of the largest cities in the world will be Asian. 65% of the world's middle class will be Asian. So if you have this tremendous growth that's really powering our region, does that mean that we've got sufficient capital to actually fund that? Frankly, no. We're still way behind in terms of how much capital is actually being deployed or raised in private equity globally. You know, we're a distant third. With China, maybe we're catching up, but we're still far away. So from my perspective, uh, continuing to find new capital to fund transactions is, is we, we, we're very far away from a period of saturation. Now, I do agree with one comment, say, so, and that is that certainly the large funds have, have captured a large chunk of new funds raised. And that in itself has an intrinsic problem, which is when you're deploying a five, ten billion dollar fund, you can only put that to work in larger transactions to make it worthwhile. So I'm certainly seeing an inflation at uh, the top end of the market, at the higher end of the market, but I certainly believe in the mid-market, which really is the driving force in GDP growth. It is the SMEs, it is the mid-class companies that really will eventually emerge as the giants of the, of the industry. And that sector continues to be underfunded. I still believe the debt capital markets, debt markets are still very efficient, and, sorry, inefficient, and that's why I certainly believe that uh, private equity has to do the very hard work of actually originating many of these transactions. But are we at a point of uh, too much capital chasing too few deals? No, certainly not. In addition to what Abrar said, I think we also need to look at sector by sector. Um, there are sectors which are secular, you know, in South Asia, you know, which is not dependent on any slowdown. Um, and these are education, healthcare. We talk about you know some secular growth sectors and on the technology front. And um, there's not enough capital you know coming into those sectors because the deal sizes are much smaller, right? So if you look at infrastructure, if you look at real estate. Uh, you know these are the sectors which are prone to slow down, and they are also attracting larger amount of capital. So the inflation will has happened on, on that part. And um, you know, when we see a slowdown, it doesn't mean that all these consumer-driven sectors, you know, they will see you know a huge capital coming in because the check sizes will remain larger, and these large equity funds they cannot just you know do a deal of twenty million dollars or fifty million dollars. They have to do something beyond hundred million dollar. Cal, go ahead. Um, if you look at the current situation globally, I think we're facing uh, declining uh, consumer demand or flat consumer demand. Uh, business orders are also uh, falling. Uh, banks are less willing to lend. Uh, the IPO markets are becoming more difficult to, uh, to uh, access. Um, and major economies are looking at negative GDP growth. So I would say uh, when I looked at the headline of this discussion point, it was uh, bracing for a market correction. I think for a PE firm with capital, the slogan is more like run or take your mark. These types of scenarios represent fantastic opportunities for a much greater level of deal flow. It's going to be driven by companies that can't access capital from equity markets or from the debt markets. It's going to be um, characterized by companies that already have too much debt and cannot afford to, to repay it. Um, and so I think there's going to be, as we look out over the next sort of six to 12 months, uh, a, a rising tide of, of opportunities, as well as um, opportunities and new technologies that require capital investment to prepare for the future. So, I mean, the current environment, um, it, it will have costs for some people, but I think for private equity firms that have capital to deploy and have the capability to execute transactions, uh, this will be a very favorable time. I guess to flip the discussion completely, um, it, we, we talk about how there is plenty of opportunity. There are obviously markets that are extremely underserved, that are capital hungry, that don't necessarily have a deep uh, local capital markets and are in need of uh, private equity flows. But if you had to 
sort of sit back and look at, I guess, more from a macro point of view, what your biggest fears and worries are at the moment. There are obviously very large and significant macro trends that could dent negatively, the, obviously, the economic growth trajectory in this region. Some countries may even be facing the potential of a recession. How do private equity firms like yours based in Asia navigate this kind of uh, potential scenario? Anyone can jump on this. Yeah, look, from our perspective, there are a number of different things that uh, always play in our minds. I'd say that the things that we can't control uh, are, are the ones that are most uh, worrisome. Uh, the things that we can control, hopefully we can do a good job of that and we actually be very active as shareholders to actually drive that. But there are probably two or three things that are uh, outside of our control. The first, which has been a perennial issue in Asia, has been currency risk. Most of the funds that are raised globally are in US dollars and we have an environment where we've had consistent um, uh, depreciation of currencies across Asia, whether it's the rupee, whether it's rupiah, whether it's the Vietnam dong. Um, and that obviously is outside of private equities uh, control, but more importantly, it's also something that private equity finds it very hard to hedge against. It is very difficult and very expensive to actually put financial hedging structures in place. So the only thing that we can do is frankly price it in. So when, when private equity buys an asset, it has to assume that currency will work against its favor and over the course of its investment holding will make enough growth in that business to actually make those returns. But that continues to be a perennial issue. I guess the other thing is, again, outside of uh, our control, is government volatility. Um, and what I mean by government vol volatility, what I don't really mean are elections, but it's really um, you know, regulations that change quite often and sometimes quite unpredictably. And again, that is always something that is hard to predict. Um, to a large extent, many private equity firms, to a large extent, now take a view that, particularly in Asia, which is increasingly liberalizing, they would like to invest in businesses that have limited uh, interference uh, or interface with government contracts or with governments. But that being said, there there's continues to be regulation that puts into place and sometimes makes it very hard for private businesses to actually succeed, whether it's, it's in terms of regulating what is uh, negative investment list in certain countries, whether it's in terms of pricing, whether it's in, t in just in terms of regulation, whether it comes in terms of taxing. That again is a very volatile space for, for private investors to navigate. Well, I think, you know, to an extent, uh, you know, we also play a good part in, you know, checking up the valuation of these companies, right? So, I think there are three things we can, we can do if there is a market correction. Number one is, um, we have to look for these themes within the sector, you know, within a country, which is, you know, which has a longer term effect on the economy, and we have to pick those themes, that's number one. Number two is that we have to be extremely, um, cognizant about what value we pay, right, um, and not get into this FOMO situation, you know, where we, you know, we have this fear of missing out and we all play a part, like I said. And number three is, I think private equity over a period of time has, you know, um, evolved to become more value creative towards the company. So we have to identify these value creation spots and work with the company, even though they are SMEs, um, you know, um, and sometimes, you know, there are a lot of things we need to do. For example, we need to beef up the management team, we need to create, you know, um, operational, we need to solve pro operational issues, we need to, you know, expand their product portfolio. So all of these things we need to do, um, and do need, and we need to do much more, you know, when the market's correct, and identify these gems, you know, we can work with. So I'm talking of things which are under our control. Yeah, yeah I think... I think there are a couple of things that we can do. I mean, clearly, I think one from investment perspective, I think the the selection process is equally important as the selection process, right? I mean, one thing that we will try to avoid is to go over on deal frenzy, for example, just because a lot of things happening in certain sectors. Maybe it's a good time to exit if it's everybody is crazy about valuation uh, rather than investment, uh, rather than making investment. So those are the things that we could look at. I think in terms of. Uh, 
where we are today in terms of, I think we, the economy overall is at an inflection point, while the economy is overall is weakening, but, you, but multiple has, is still very strong. So you got to really, really time it the way we, where you want to be uh, from, from overall thing that we could do for, for portfolio company. There are a couple of things that we could do. I think one of the most important thing is to look at internal improvement. Right, in terms of what you can do, I think uh, Raj mentioned earlier, in terms of how best we can rate the company during the downturn. During the downturn, uh, guess what? Everything will in cost, and in fact, generally your cost will come down, your raw material costs or certain other costs that you could take advantage of. Uh, you could start in other initiative because management has a bit of spare time to do other things. You should start looking at digitalization in terms of something, your processes, looking at inter other in form of internal uh, improvement. You could also start looking at consolidation opportunity within the industry itself, right? Uh, clearly, um, not all companies are made equal. Some has more leverage balance sheet or has more le uh, less defensive uh, financial, which you could take advantage of by acquiring this, this company in, in this difficult time. Uh, the question was, you know, what are the macroeconomic risks facing us in Asia? Um, as I just think of this now, but I think that over the last 40 years, uh, Asia has thrived uh, economically, uh, culturally, uh, in all kinds of aspects. And the generation, the people who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s have driven that. Um, as I look forward, though, I, I think we need to basically reevaluate the, uh, the compact that the citizens have with the governments. Governments need to be accountable to the people. Uh, there needs to be controls on things like corruption. And for the younger generation, they're going to have a different path than their parents did. And so we need to provide that younger generation with uh, a sense of opportunity, a sense of uh, belonging to the community, and ability to contribute to society that's meaningful for them. And that will be different than the path that we've had the last 40 years. And I think, I think it's all very achievable, but I mean, if we get that wrong, then I think, um, I think that's a big macroeconomic risk. Um, picking up on uh, also a point um, that uh, was made by Abra about the difficulty of navigating a, a region like, I mean, Asia, I mean, even just Southeast Asia, just looking at the different regulatory uh, environments that you're facing, uh, the fact that sometimes these regulatory paths are extremely unpredictable. I mean, would you argue that in this kind of context, uh, uh, probably uh, sort of Asia-based firms, firms that were born in Asia, private equity firms that were born in Asia, uh, those that might, might be smaller funds that focus on SMEs and have very strong experience on the ground, uh, are potentially better placed and still have a very strong competitive advantage over the big funds that are now coming in and have come in quite recently and are starting these new funds in the region? Yeah, I, I think that's a statement, right? That's not a question. That's a question. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. No, no, I, 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 I would certainly agree with that statement. It's a statement that we make all the time. We go out and pitch and we say, you know, we're the largest firm that's focused on a particular industry based in Asia, uh, with our expertise in Asia, with our knowledge in Asia, our ability to drive value in Asia. However, trouble is, 70% of capital that's raised in our industry, in private equity, goes to the big boys. And that's really a function, unfortunately, not necessarily a function of the fact that we locally are not doing a good, a good enough job, because uh, you know, when it comes to actual absolute returns, I think arguably uh, we're actually making better returns. Uh, but the issue is also one of deployment at the LP level. Uh, you know, An LP probably won't be fine if they invested in KKR and KKR didn't do too well. But if uh, we didn't do too well, I'm sure the LP would be fired. So I think that they, there is a, uh, a natural conservativeness that takes place. And it's across different strategies. So for example, um, you know, whether it's the health strategy or SME strategy or growth strategy, the large boys take, take the, uh, the, the, the bulk of it. Uh, one of the other areas, for example, we've been invested for a long time is in something called impact investing. So creating social change through private capital. Again, the large boys only came into this game probably in the last 18 months. But if you look at the statistics, just globally in the last 18 months, something like 80% of all capital that's raised now in impact investing that's meant to be for smaller businesses 
has gone to the big boys. So look, there's a natural economies of scale that the uh, the big boys are enjoying, and good luck to good luck to them. But you know, we'll certainly make the argument that we're better placed be, be, being local. Seems like you're just waiting for them to fail and see them just go, go crashing and burning down. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> Anyone else want to add? Okay. Um, in terms of trying to, again, navigate what may or may not become um, quite a tricky uh, macroeconomic scenario in the region, uh, before coming on stage, we were making the point that um, the fact that some private equity firms, like the ones being represented here on stage, focus on specific sectors uh, and sectors that could and should weather uh, a potential downturn could be a massive advantage. Um, and I wanted to uh, talk to Raj a little bit about focusing on education and essentially how that uh, has been for you in Southeast Asia, in a market also like India, and how optimistic you are uh, about trying to weather potential downturns by focusing on these kinds of industries. Yes, so I think this is my second cycle, you know, investing in consumer sectors, including education. And I've seen over the last two cycles, education has been one sector which did not get affected as much. I mean, certain segments do, but largely if you're talking about traditional education, you know, it's not been affected because people won't pull out their kids from the school or from an English language training center. Um, having said that, I think, uh, you know, there are two things we are we have to be aware of and we have to prepare ourselves. One is you know, the larger funds uh, or the funds which can deploy, a, you know, a smaller amount of capital per deal, they would definitely make lives harder for us uh, by, you know, by, you know, becoming a competitor. Um, so our strategy is that we should be able to, um, you know, make investment just because we have known the entrepreneur for a long period of time. We should be able to identify themes within the segment which are better for us and not just run for, you know, any company which is raising money and, you know, so, so that's, that's the, uh, you know, our advantage we should play on. Right, that's number one. Number two is, because of our position in the sector, we should be proactive in helping entrepreneurs, even if we are not investors, you know, even if we have not invested in them. And that actually stays a long way, um, you know, and we have made some investment, not many, you know, in our fund where we have known the entrepreneurs for a long period of time, and over a period of time they have seen us, you know, and they come back to us, kind of do kind of pro bono consulting with them. Um, so those are the edges we want to play on, um, and um, and you know we have seen it work. So can I go ahead? So we're in a very similar boat uh, to Raj's firm in the sense that we're also sector focused. We're probably one of the largest uh, healthcare focused investment firms uh, on the ground in Asia, and I'd say we make a very similar argument. I think you know each firm, each one of us has a very different personality in terms of how we invest. But I'd share with you two principles that are very important to us when it comes to that domain knowledge. First, we strongly believe that in order to be successful as an investor, you have to understand what you invest in. So domain knowledge is very, very important. The second principle, I won't walk you, walk you through all of them, but the second principle, which is by far our most important principle, is to be successful as an investor, you have to add value. Now, the unfortunate reality is that as uh, we represent money in investing. Money is not enough to succeed. If you lead with capital in today's market, it is going to be very difficult to create alpha, very difficult to get superior and consistent returns. So you have to lead, in our opinion, with a strategic angle where you bring m more than money to the table, more than money to an entrepreneur. And I fa in fact, that was something that was a lesson, thankfully, I learned in the very first deal that I did in Asia. Uh, and this was a deal that I invested in, in in Indonesia, in one of the large pharmaceutical manufacturing businesses. And this was a 60-year-old company led by a second-generation entrepreneur. And when we went and pitched to him and said, look, you've got a fantastic business, children grow up with your products, this is how much money we'd like to invest in your business to take it to the next stage. His reaction was, thank you, join the queue, and you know what, I eat three times a day, and with your money, I'm not going to eat four times a day. And that is not an untypical response. You know, access to capital, as we represent capital, unfortunately, 
is not unique. There are many sources of capital. So to succeed as an investor, you really need to bring more to the table. You need to bring a strategic angle that helps develop that business that is not something that the debt capital markets can do, that not, not something that the equity capital markets can do, and hopefully not something that your neighbor can do. It has to be something very unique. And that really comes down to, again, building a strong strategic capability with our, within our firms. And that, to us, is one of the most important elements for consistency of good returns. And I guess probably just to quickly add to that, um, I don't know if the, the panel agrees to that, there is oftentimes some investors um, also point to the fact that in some parts of Asia, there's also a cultural aversion to have your own company. It might be sort of family owned, that opening it up to foreign or external uh, investors and having that. So I think it's, there's an added uh, obstacle oftentimes in terms of having, winning the trust of, of these kinds of firms for sure. Um, Kyle, I actually wanted to uh, ask you, obviously, uh, your firm focuses on industrials um, at a time when, obviously, we see this U.S.-China trade dispute uh, not showing any signs of slowing down, uh, potentially impacting uh, supply chains in the region. How are you looking at navigating what may or may not be resolved uh, as a key uh, macroeconomic hurdle? It, considering the sector that you are looking at and that you focus on? So we really don't spend that much time thinking about it. Um, some of those Very businesses possible. in China will relocate to Southeast Asia. Perhaps they might relocate to India. Uh, we've been investing in industrials for over 30 years uh, in Asia. And I mean, the opportunity in front of us is not simply taking sports shoes or t-shirts out of China to someplace else. The opportunity in front of us is all about the digitization of data. In the last 20 years, you know, data has been largely a consumer opportunity. Uh, Facebook, for example, and even people like Grab, and that's all about the collection of data on people. Going forward, what I think we're going to see is, is going to be the application of that data. And the application of that data will be largely through machines. It'll be the Internet of Things, it'll be robotics, it'll be artificial intelligence, it will be things like uh, autonomous vehicles. And that opportunity is, uh, is brand new. And I think um, it's going to be a global opportunity. And those of us in Asia are really well positioned to take advantage of it because we manufacture most of the things in the world to begin with. We have a strong culture of manufacturing. We have deep value chains of sourcing, of logistics, of transportation. Um, and we have a very well-trained workforce for it. So as I look forward to the future, I think that we're looking at a completely different industrial revolution. Uh, people like General Electric, you know, had cut their teeth 50 years ago making kitchen appliances. They don't do that today. The kitchen appliances of the future will be intelligent. Uh, automobiles, of course, will be intelligent. The opportunities in front of us from digitalization are, are tremendous. And so that's where I think, you know, at Shaw Quay, we want to focus our attention. Um, relations between governments, you know, they're interesting to read the newspaper. It's drama. Uh, we have no say-so over it. And actually, we don't even really know what's going on. But down at the micro level with companies that are that are providing products for tomorrow, um, that's where we spend our time. Yeah, no, my main question was looking at, obviously, the it's unpredictable. No one knows how this is going to play out. Uh, no one knows if this is going to be some problem that could be resolved in the short term or might have more fundamental and structural changes in the long term. But mainly looking at if and when, presumably, you're looking at potential scenarios, if manufacturing patterns and potential supply chains change, how does a fund prepare itself for that? Does it also mean that it precisely be in light of these changes, you are focusing more, it makes sense to focus more on digitization, on different kinds of firms that are more tech savvy, for example? Yes, and, and I think, you know, making smaller batches and making products that are closer to the, uh, to the consumer because, you know, eventually people will, uh, companies will make products that are very uniquely tailored for your specific requirements that you, that you want. Um, the opportunity in Europe is tremendous, again, for Asian companies to, to penetrate. You know, Europe is, um, 
uh, been in a, a state of steady decline for many years now. The German auto industry is suffering because people have said, you know, I don't want an internal combustion engine. I'm going to wait. I'm going to hold off for that electric vehicle to come out 2020, 2021. And so they're, they're basically seeing a downturn in business uh, or in production opportunities. So, I mean, these, the, 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 the government's uh, disagreements and their negotiations and arguments are really, I think, a manifestation of the changes that we're seeing at the industrial level, at the, at the local consumer level. Well, I have a question for all of us, you know, including myself, which is, like, do we change our investment strategy if there's a slowdown, going for more digital and tech, which is happening in all our sectors, like health tech or industrial tech, ed tech, what do you guys think? Well, yes, that will involve some change in strategy of taking early stage risk, technology, not to talk about the valuation which you dislike. Well, maybe I can just add some. I mean, I think, you know, 20 years ago um, in Asian industrial investing, we took a minority stake. It was often about finding a great entrepreneur, backing him, providing some new capital, perhaps to, you know, build a new factory somewhere, expand. I think the next iteration is going to require significant investment. And in those cases, I think it's not going to be capable. You're not going to be able to take it. You shouldn't take a minority stake. You need to really take a majority stake. You need to really think about things like uh, bringing ERP into the company, a new marketing strategy for that business, a new branding for that business, and again, massive investment in technology that needs to be carefully thought out because, you know, if you make the wrong sorts of investments, you end up uh, having something that is not valuable. I wanted to bring Yasir in because uh, Equinas, I think earlier this year, year marked 10 to 15 percent um, uh, of the fund to tech investments. So the, I guess the exactly sort of the, the total. Right. I, I, I think this strategy is a conscious strategy because what we started seeing is also much of fear of losing out. But what we started seeing is that 10 to 15 percent or 20 to 30 percent of deal flows are really coming from tech or tech related industry. But when we talk about tech, we are not going to invest in deep technology because we don't understand deep technology, right? What we're going to invest in is tech, tech enabled infrastructure, tech services, and, or, or tech services, uh, whether it's tech infrastructure or tech services being the form of data center, web hosting, and so forth, or tech services, uh, or fulfillment or logistic type of services. So those are the areas that we think that it's not only relevant when we make an investment, but it could also give us a window for us to understand the impact of disruption to our existing business or our portfolio company. And being by making investment early in those sectors, you are able to, to understand what form of disruption that could potentially happen in your, uh, in your portfolio company, as well as it gives you access or network to tech, tech people in general. Right? It's quite refreshing when you sit down to some of uh, venture capitals or startups in terms of what solutions are they thinking about. Uh, but by virtue of you making investment early in the sector, uh, you have access to knowledge much earlier compared to your competitor. Because I seriously think that uh, investing in tech is in inevitable. Uh, we can say that, yeah, we don't want to invest in tech technology. That's not us. Uh, but to do that, you must change the mindset of clearly whether it's, uh, whether it's the IC, the investment committee, or your team members as well. Because for a lot of us, uh, I, I think I can speak for almost all of us, we are largely a buyout fund, right? But to invest in tech, tech-related company, you got to move from that mindset, uh, right? You can buy that or you can invest in tech, tech-related investment to enhance your company, but you're making by making an isolation investment in technology, by virtue of that, all that's available is probably 10 to 20 percent, right? Because they prefer multiple, clearly multiple shareholders, multiple partners, and so forth for them to uh, to to, uh, to grow the business. So that is the single largest deal. And then the key man risk: How do you address key man risk? How do you address investment structure? How do you address all of these issues will come into play? So I think from our perspective, to ready ourselves for those type of investment, what we have done is really, really go back and prepare a framework in terms of how we can make those investments so that people don't go all over the place, right? Because deep tech or biotech is not something that we want to play in, but what we want to, More want to play in is really an area of technology that we can't always understand. There's a, uh, there's a hinge of old, old 
economy induced tech enabled com company. Could you quickly just uh, tell us in terms of the timing per se, why at this specific point in time did Equinos, which is uh, obviously uh, owned by the government of Malaysia, decide to earmark this amount of money to tech? What was the trigger? I mean, obviously we know the broader trend of the importance of, of tech, etc. but why now? Well, it's not really why now, because we have actually invested in tech tech related company about three, four years ago. It, it, it's, it's a mature tech, it's really an airtime transfer company, uh, which we have exited. But that company, what we've discovered clearly is most technology or technology related company that as circumstances changes, the company are able to navigate it through. So it started as an airtime transfer company to become more a money transfer company. So it becomes a backbone player. So it was eventually acquired by a digital comp uh, wallet company that's based out of Hong Kong. Right? So by having that first taste of our investment in technology, uh, we started thinking that, and that it, maybe this is an area that we could look good into further because we made a pretty decent return uh, from that investment, which we thought that on the outset to think about the investment, this is a bit iffy, a lot of assumptions going into it, but we went with it. Anyway, because tech investment requires very much an investment thesis driven, value creation driven is uh, yes and no, right? I mean, there are, if you think about how do you add value to a lot of tech tech driven company, I think the, when you speak to a lot of private equity that he has invested in tech, it's really thesis driven. How can they institutionalize the company as check size become bigger? It's more relevant to the PPP. How do you corporatize and institutionalize those companies? Uh, that's what tech companies are looking at, uh, looking for from private equity as an investment. Thank you. Abar. Look, I, mean, I, I agree with some of what Said said in terms of the different strategies because I think we fundamentally believe that a, a buyout or a growth strategy is very different to a technology early stage investment strategy. The risks, the rewards, the mindset are entirely different. Uh, but again, let me take a step back. Uh, in the health space, which is what we invest in, we certainly believe, believe it, that it's the bigger issues right now uh, that are much more visible, low hanging fruit as investment opportunities. Let me give you context. We believe in healthcare over the next eight years, total healthcare spend in Asia will be larger than that of the US and Europe combined. About a four hundred sorry, about a four trillion dollar consumer led market. And that really speaks to where we think the investment opportunities, and that's where the large capital is going to go. However, technology is playing what I would call an incremental uh, effect on healthcare. It's not having that transformative effect of healthcare that we've seen in other industries. In other industries, the largest car business is a technology company. The, the, the largest hotels business is a, is a technology company. Uh, the largest retailer is a technology company. That is not the case in healthcare. Healthcare plays a very important but still incremental role. And we think the best way to, do, to play those is to actually have different funds that play to those different strategies. So we have our large growth fund, uh, which is focused on really the macro opportunity, the large scalar, scale opportunity, and then a much smaller, what I would call VC fund, that's focused much more on very specific thematics that we believe are going to be important drivers of technology. But it's a very different mindset. We are starting to run out of time, but one uh, point that I did want to put to the panel is the question of to what degree you think that restructuring businesses in, uh, in the Asian market is a very interesting opportunity? I mean, it's oftentimes, um, they might be sort of opportunities that resemble more sort of distressed assets, but to what degree is it something that you think does provide a potential value, especially when, for example, we see a lot of entrepreneurs that might be facing very tricky succession um, uh, situations, and that's a point in time where MPE could come in. Uh, what does the panel think about this? Well, I, I think restructuring opportunities make a lot of sense, and I think they can create value. I think there, there needs to be something within the company, though, that is, that is really valuable. Uh, there can be some mistakes, there can be things that need to be corrected, but I mean, if it's a completely flawed company, you can't, you can't really save it. But restructuring financially, that's a very sound idea. Uh, certain aspects, maybe they've overexpanded too quickly and they need to be reined in, or maybe they've missed out on an opportunity. I think, I think this is, in fact, in a recessionary environment, more of these restructuring opportunities will become uh, prevalent.
Well, not in my sector, honestly. I mean, we look for teams which are very growth oriented. Either we put growth capital or we do a buyout. Um, after investing, obviously we do a lot of tweaks in the product, in the team, in the operation, but those are not strictly restructuring. Uh, if there is a correction, there's a downturn, we might need to tweak product, might need to change prices, might need to, you know, shut down some of the branches, all of that, but those are, you know, reactionary in nature um, and not going into an investment for restructuring the company. Yeah, I agree with Carl. I think financial restructuring makes a lot of sense, but if there's something fundamentally flawed about a business model, you can't restructure out of that. Frankly, we're very wary of restructuring. I mean, I think we found it very hard. I think one of the key lessons uh, that I learned early on, uh, perhaps it's my experience and it's a con as a consequence of very conservative about that, is that one of the hardest things to do is to turn a loss-making business, which traditional restructuring companies involve, into a profit-making business and then selling it at profit. So you're taking something that's negative, so you're paying for a value not based on cash flow, and then you're going to sell it for something that's based on cash flow. That's a very difficult transition to make. If you're buying a buy technology company that's going to be loss making or a technology company, you're probably going to sell it whilst it's still loss making. If you're going to buy a business that's loss making and then you're going to hope in your three to five year period to turn it into a sustainable cash flow and then sell it at multiple of that, very difficult. And I think that we've been very conservative around that. Okay, we've basically run out of time, but one last point, just as a conclusion. Uh, going back to, I guess, the initial prompt for this discussion, uh, looking at 2020, I mean, will we be seeing the same level of deal flow, the same level of appetite that we have been seeing uh, in the, 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 the last few months, uh, also the same uh, level and hopefully more, as Barbara was mentioning, maybe more uh, capital uh, allocated also in, in this part of the world, uh, that maybe the dry powder uh, balance might shift. What are your predictions? This mic list, yeah. I think there'll be more deal flow. I think there'll be more opportunities uh, next year than there are this year. I take a long-term view. I don't take a one-year view. I think there'll be one year there may be volatility, uh, two years there may be volatility. Again, look at the big picture. This is Asia's century. You know, look at the big picture. This, in our time frame, there is going to be the greatest transference of wealth in a generation. That's the big picture. And that, to me, will continue to drive the long-term future of Asia. I think there's going to be more deal flow. I tend to agree with that view because of the record fundraising. So for a lot of private equity, for a lot of private equity, it's actually a good time to sell. Well, we need to, uh, you know, continue investing. We invest for five years, hold asset for seven years. So it's very tough to say that by the next one year, what are you going to do? If there is no deal flow, we need to create, go meet companies and you know, invest in them in the next two years, not, you know, not next, next year. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, thank you to the panel for uh, discussing this topic with us today and for taking the time and for uh, the audience for listening to us. Thank you so much.